Welcome to the Real Love Podcast Series, right here on the Sharon Salzberg Meta Hour. This series features a variety of conversations with some of the world's finest teachers and thinkers, all exploring Sharon's forthcoming book, Real Love, The Art of Mindful Connection. Real Love is a field guide for anyone seeking awakened living in the 21st century. The book is now available for pre-order and is available in stores on June 6th. Learn more at SharonSalzberg.com. This podcast is brought to you by the Be Here Now Network. If you're interested in supporting this podcast, please visit www.BeHereNowNetwork.com backslash Sharon. Hi, I'm Sharon Salzberg, and my guest today is Tim DeChristopher. Tim and I met last year when we did an event together at the Rubin Museum, and I was really impressed with him and his approach to life and climate activism, and I felt like I learned a lot, and it was, it was a fantastic uh, kind of meeting, so I wanted to invite him to be part of this podcast series for Real Love. So Tim is a climate activist and co-founder of the environmental group Peaceful Uprising. In December of 2008, Tim disrupted a Bureau of Land Management oil and gas auction by registering as Bidder 70 and outbidding oil companies for land parcels in national parks in Utah. For this act of civil disobedience, Tim was sentenced to two years in federal prison, of which he served a total of 21 months. Upon receiving his sentence, Tim released the following statement. You can steer my commitment to a healthy and just world if you agree with it, but you can't kill it. This is not going away. At this point of unimaginable threats on the horizon, this is what hope looks like. In these times of a morally bankrupt government that has sold out its principles, this is what patriotism looks like. With countless lives on the line, this is what love looks like, and it will only grow. Tim was released from prison on April 21st, 2013, studied at Harvard Divinity School, and continues to work to spread the urgency of the climate crisis and the need for bold confrontational action in order to create a just and healthy world. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. I'm so glad to see you again. Me too. So uh, that was an amazing statement you made after your release. Oh, thank um, you. It was very moving. And can you talk a little bit about what that period of time was for you? Um, yeah, it's it was it was a a challenging period of time. And actually, when I when I look back on that period of time before I got locked up, now um, mostly what I think about was was how dysfunctional it was on a on a personal level. Um, because I was so focused on the work that I was doing. Um, and, and so I was causing a lot of destruction in my personal relationships at the time. Um, and, and so it's, it's interesting to see sort of the, the love and the passion and the care that I poured into statements like, like that. Um, when I was kind of neglecting the people that were around me at the same time, um, but yeah, that that uh, statement in my sentencing hearing was the first time in the whole court process of two and a half years that that I was able to speak openly in the court, and um, and so there was a lot that had built up, and it was kind of the first chance that I had to really explain myself um, because I was so restricted when during the trial when the jury was in the room. Um, so um, yeah, I wanted to I wanted to fully explain myself and it felt um yeah it felt like this was um my moment to exist in history sort of no i think you really do i you know i followed you uh obviously long before i met you and uh was very um felt very involved i contributed to your defense fund you know (laughs) i was like you know you're you're kind of in my mind and uh my heart certainly and i was i would think about you and uh, as I told you that night at the room, and I was very upset <laughs> when you went to prison. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I think um, I think there was a lot of that 
that sentiment that um, a lot of people that I'd never met really made an emotional connection yeah. there. Um, you know, which is which is always interesting when I meet those folks. Um, and they're like, oh, I feel like I know you so much. Yeah. Right. Um, but, but yeah, I think that's that's also kind of part of the the value of civil disobedience, um, and and the critical importance of uh, of being open when we put ourselves in positions like that and, and telling our story, um, and it sort of allows people to make that personal connection. Yeah. You know, one of the big um, ongoing arguments that I've had with with a section of the the climate movement. Uh, for the past, I don't know, four or five years or so, has has been about wearing masks when when people do an action, and you know we saw a lot of that like in in Standing Rock and in other places, um, and I've always argued that it um, it really hinders the ability to to build a movement and to to allow people to connect with us on on a personal level, mm-hmm. um, which which I think is um, the the way that movements really grow, um, and the way that people are empowered. I, I think that's really true, and it's it's sort of like I know it must be confounding because people like me, of course, I didn't know you at all, you know, on, on one level, uh, and yet, you know, as a I guess a symbol or representative of of an action, and somebody who, I mean, I don't know your particular issues or traumas or you know what you had to overcome mm-hmm. to do that. I know. A little bit, I think, what I would have to overcome, you know, and and so of course that got highlighted in a good way, you know. Like I know for myself, for example, in um, a, a time when it feels like the news we're getting and the kind of official statements are duplicitous, you know, it brings up a tremendous amount for me about a you know a childhood full of secrets, for example, and so uh, it's the one thing mm-hmm. that. I have the most challenge dealing with, you know, not being told the truth hmm. and not just having it out there. And, um, you know, and, and so I see kind of the range of my reactions and I know I have to, I have to um, acknowledge those reactions before I, I go through it, you know, and, and go forward. And, and so I'm sure it's like something is there for everybody, whatever it is. And just knowing that there must be, is kind of encouraging. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, you know, and, and some of that we we sort of have to acknowledge and overcome, you know, yeah. that the ways in which that can be destructive. Um, but there's but there's also a lot of opportunity in the way that that works of, of the power of our empathy when we are in a way experiencing what the other person is experiencing. Um, you know, and the more we learn about neuroscience and, and how mirror neurons work and things like that, you know, it's in in some ways we really are experiencing. We, you know, mental mm-hmm. level we are mm-hmm. having the same experience, and it's changing our brain. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, when when we're connecting with someone who is doing something powerful, um, it it's sort of a practice for ourselves yeah. Yeah. to to be able to step into that role as yeah. well. Yeah, no, I think it's true. It's like. Uh, one of my friends used to say one of the things he found really confounding about life was that um, nobody, for example, maybe could run a four-minute mile, and then suddenly somebody runs, one person runs a four-minute mile, suddenly a lot of people can run a four-minute mile. Yeah. You know, it, it's what it takes. It really does take that. Right. Yeah, it, it really opens up the the boundaries of, of possibility. Yeah. Um, you know, but the scary thing is that that works in, in both directions. Yeah. You know, that, like, you know, it used to be inappropriate to say a lot of things in, in public and express a lot of bigotries and, and hateful rhetoric and that sort of thing. And then, you know, one public persona breaks those boundaries and, and all of a sudden it can unleash uh, a huge amount of, of yeah. hatred into our society. Um, and and so, you know, it's something that... Um, that, that we need to be very conscious of, of, of what kind of boundaries we're opening up. That's really fascinating. So that also brings me to the question of love, <laughs> you know, and like, yeah. and uh, whatever, however forcefully action being motivated by a feeling of love, 
maybe it also opens up those boundaries and sort of, even if it's not explicit, somehow in, in one's demeanor or being, you know, and, and, and to, to be coming from that place um, maybe also opens up the possibility for others so that they could be motivated not so much by hatred, you know, or rancor, but, but by love. Right. Yeah, and I think, I think per, for me, um, sort of one of the, one of the social struggles that that we engage in in doing this kind of work, um, is is demonstrating the strength and the the power that comes from acting out of love, um, because it's it's so easily in our popular culture to think of love as this kind of soft sentimentality um, or as weakness um, and and to think that the real force and and power and strength in the world is is embodied in um, either some kind of stoicism or sort of like outright hatred or Machiavellianism or something like that um, so you know I think it's it's not only, important to act out of love, but to demonstrate that, um, that acting out of love can be, um, can be powerful, can be bold, can be confrontational. Yeah, that's fantastic. Cause I mean, and it's in one way, I think part of, um, the ways, even though they don't often go together in popular thinking, I think meditation and action, uh, can really go together because there's something about that introspection and coming up against questions like, what really makes me happy? You know, what have I been taught? What have I been told? What myths have been propagated? But what really makes me happy? And what is strength, actually? Is all this sort of bitterness and hatred and vengefulness? And is that is it that strong, really? And what is the toll of anger? You know, there's the positive side, perhaps, of anger, of the energy. and But what's, what toll is it taking on me or my relationships or... Or you know, and and so we get the chance to see for ourselves, not something we've been fed or taught, and and that's I think an incredible strength because, of course, you're right. I I mean, so much of my work is in loving kindness meditation, and so I hear that all the time. Like I don't know about that, you know. <laughs> then I end up a doormat, and I end up just sort of sloppy, sentimental. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you know, for me, the anger and and love have always been intertwined um you know and I've, I've never really felt that they were opposite ends mm -hmm. of of a dichotomy and you know one of the um one of the things that that i was most inspired by in divinity school um was beverly harrison and and her work um the power of anger in the work of love uh, which which talks about the ways that um anger and love are mutually supportive and and even at the time when I was disrupting the auction, um, I, I saw the way that those kind of emotions um, intermingled with one another because the, the only other person in the auction room that, that I knew, that I recognized, was a woman from my church who was sitting on the other side of the room and towards the back. And, um, and as things were, were developing, um, I watched her start to cry. And, and first softly, but then really start crying pretty heavily. And, and I knew what was going on for her. I knew that just the, the coldness and the inhumanity of, um, of what was happening was, was so saddening to her. Um, and, and I could sense that um, what I was turning outward and, and feeling as anger of, the, of how outrageous that, that coldness and that inhumanity of this process were. Um, she was turning inward and experiencing as sadness. Um, but the, the depth of her emotion that she openly expressed in that way, in a lot of ways, justified the depth of emotion that I was feeling, um, even though it was manifesting differently within me. Um, it, it gave me the sense that, oh, I'm, I'm not crazy here for feeling this strong emotion at what's going on here, that, mm -hmm. that this is not okay. Um, and so her, her vulnerability in, 
in expressing that emotion, um, you know, that, that a lot of people would say, um, you know, oh, it's, it's useless to just like, you know, express your sadness in public and cry in that way. Um, you know, like, oh, you're not doing anything. You're just crying about it. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, but, but what she was feeling was authentic. It was the truth. And mm-hmm. by expressing it, um, she, she emboldened others to, to share their truth as well. And, um, and reminded us that, that we're not alone. And, um, and so I think that's a really powerful and important thing, thing to do, um, to honor those strong emotions, um, even if they're considered inappropriate at the time, whether that's, um, the powerful love that we feel, the, the sadness that we feel, the anger that we feel, um, those, those are coming from somewhere real and, and definitely need to be acknowledged. Yeah. I mean, the, uh, even in Buddhist teaching, you know, um, in the Buddhist psychology, when they talk about anger, it's the positive part is that energy, you know, Mm -hmm. it's like sheer energy, which keeps us from being complacent or passive and helps us draw boundaries, helps us look deeper. It's the way sometimes it's, um, I often say sometimes it's the angriest person in the room who's the most truthful, hmm. like it's saying, look at that problem over there that no one else wants to look at. Um, yeah. But uh, it's also said in the Buddhist psychology that uh, anger is likened to a forest fire which can burn up its own support so it can devastate us and can damage us. And like a forest fire, um, it can burn really wild so that we might end up in a place very far from where we want to be, you know, so... Mm-hmm. Uh, one of the characteristics of not feeling anger because we feel what we feel. I completely agree with you. It's it's authentic. It's what's happening. But being lost in it so much that right. it's determining our choices. Um, if that's what happens, that it's in a way defining us, then usually it's, there's a lot of tunnel vision and anger. We, f- we see very few options. Mm-hmm. You know, like if you think about the last time you were really, really angry at yourself, it's not a time usually where you think, you know, I said that stupid thing, but I did five great things the same morning, you know. Those five great things are gone. Right. You know, so it's that collapse that's really a, a huge problem, mm-hmm. as well as the potential for the kind of inner devastation. So the challenge seems to be how do you capture that energy right, without being so defined by it? Well, you know, f- for me, um, I feel like from the outside I was really defined by by that kind of energy mm-hmm. in, um, in my in my public role at, in the climate movement and, and a lot of the climate movement looked at me as like, um, you know, not necessarily the anger guy, but definitely like the civil disobedience guy, the confrontation guy. Um, and, and wanted me to play that role of, um, you know, the, the angry, um, inflammatory rhetoric kind of speeches at rallies and that sort of thing. Um, and I, and I'm good at that. And, um, and sometimes I do feel that, um, but it's not always. <laughs> yeah, right. It's not always what I'm feeling. Mm-hmm. Um, but but for me, you know, I I wasn't defining um, my own action primarily as um, as coming out of anger. What I felt right afterwards um, was that it was that it was coming out of integrity. That um, what I recognized pretty shortly after that that action was that that was for me a moment of really intense connection with my authentic self. I felt like, like that action, um, grew out of, out of something really deep within me. And, and at that time in my life, um, I wasn't spending a a whole lot of, uh, time or intention on, uh, on self-reflection and, um, and getting to know myself on, on that level. And, and so I think of, I think of that moment as sort of like, um, a moment of grace (laughs) where, where I had, where I sort of stumbled into that, um, integrity and, and connection with my, with my true self. Um, but realizing that that, that that powerful moment grew out of that moment of, of, kind of the grace of integrity there um, made me realize that in order to to hold on to that, that I had to be intentional about um, cultivating 
that connection with my authentic self. Um, you know, and so for, for me, it wasn't necessarily a, um, a timeline of like, first I have to get to know myself on <laughs> really authentically. Um, you know, I sort of stumbled into the action first and then had yeah. to, uh, um, build up the structure for it. To, so to, my mirror neurons to, are really firing because to... of course my path was the opposite. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so I think that, that difference between, um, just defining something as as the anger versus defining something as um, the integrity mm-hmm, of, mm-hmm, of mm-hmm. honoring what we're deeply feeling uh, is is the critical difference and the way that that we can avoid falling into that idolization of anger. Mm-hmm. So is that was that feeling of wanting to continue or deepen that uh, connection? What led to divinity school? Is that what happened? Um, I don't know. Because <laughs> I, I, because I was following you, and yeah. I, I looked at that and I thought, "Whoa, that's interesting too." You know, divinity school. Yeah that that came from from a few different directions. Um, you know, and the first the first thing that that kind of brought it into my mind was um, was a little more pragmatic. That um, I was in the in the period before I got locked up in that two and a half years when I was kind of operating as a full-time activist um, and and traveling around and, and kind of realizing that I was good at some of this work that I had stumbled into, um, I I looked around and, and thought like, okay, how can I continue doing this work? And I looked at professional activists that were working for nonprofits and NGOs and things. And, and I thought they're not doing the, the same work that I'm doing. Um, this, this is something very different. Um, and and when I looked around, I realized that the the person who seemed to be the closest to doing what the kind of work that I felt like I was doing, the kind of work that I felt like I was called to do, w- was my minister in Salt Lake City, Tom Goldsmith. And um, and that was kind of surprising to me to realize that. And that's the first time I I kind of took that that path seriously. And so that's what got me started thinking about it. And, um, and then that was, um, that was also kind of happening at the same time that, um, that I was realizing that the challenge for the climate movement was shifting. And, you know, this was in the 2010, 2011, uh, time after the failures of Copenhagen and that sort of thing, when, when it became increasingly clear that we're not going to stop climate change. And, and so I was seeing that the, the challenge for our movement was shifting from being primarily about reducing emissions to being at least as much about figuring out how we can maintain our humanity in this period of really chaotic change that's largely inevitable. Um, and, and looking around our movement at that time, um, we didn't have any of the tools and skills to even begin having that conversation about how we hold on to hope in desperate times about um, how we hold on to our values and and our humanity um, in in major disruption and chaos. Um, but I felt like the religious traditions of the world did have a set of tools and skills for that um, because those are the, the times in people's lives when they turn to mm-hmm. religion mm-hmm. The, mm-hmm. the strongest. And, and so I felt like there was something there that, that could teach us a lot about... Um, this time period that we're entering into. I just uh, spent some time in California with a Tibetan teacher of mine, Sonny Rupche, mm-hmm. and uh, he he said uh, something, and I just, I greeted it with like, I guess I doubled over with laughter, you know, because he looked at me like, whoa. He said something like, in Tibet we have a saying, uh, you should build a latrine before you get the diarrhea, mm. <laughs> you know, and, which I just thought was the funniest thing. Uh, but of course we don't often do that, <laughs> you know, we... We wait for the crisis, or we right. the bottom has to fall out because we're just happily going our way, you know. Right, you know, and and in the case of climate change, that can be really destabilizing. Um, you know, it it makes sense for the latrine, um, you know, but when it becomes something like um, what happened in in Pakistan about a year ago, when um, 
they had their second um, really intense heat wave coming, and they started digging mass graves in anticipation of this heat wave yeah. that was being forecast. Because the year before, they had had thousands of bodies with nothing to do with them. Um, and so they dug anticipatory mass graves. Um, and in reading that news... Uh, just really rattled me, yeah. even as yeah. even as somebody who pays close attention to this stuff. Um, that that news just sort of um, shook me in a, on a different level. Mm-hmm. That um, that there was something really significant about um, entering that era of anticipatory mass graves, yeah. and um, you know, and and it and it led to me then organizing an action up in Boston. Um, with some activists that I work with up there who are fighting uh, a a pipeline, the West Roxbury natural gas pipeline that was going through Boston and and seeing the pictures from Pakistan of this long trench they were digging as a mass grave, it looked just like the trench that they were digging through through Boston for this pipeline. and And so we ended up um, doing an action in which we took over that construction site and laid down in that pipeline. Um, in the same way the bodies were laid in that trench in Pakistan um, and and had some local clergy and religious leaders there who were practicing their mass grave eulogies and uh, and we were trying to kind of connect the dots between um, these trenches that we're digging here for more fossil fuel infrastructure and the trenches that will be dug in other places yeah for mass graves from from climate change yeah um so it, um, you know, it, it, it sort of harkened back to, to, Ilg- to Gilgamesh of um, digging your own grave, yeah. which, is, which is a, uh, um, I think, perhaps a useful exercise. Well, it's always a useful exercise, yeah. I think, you know. And, you know, but it, it's so difficult to hang in there with uncomfortable feeling, right? To, mm-hmm. to uh I mean, there's a reason why not everybody knows what happened in Pakistan, right? And doesn't seek out that knowledge. You know, if it's not readily available, it's like, I don't think that's how I'm going to spend my evening. (laughs) You know, it's like looking for that. And also to be able to sit with that and uh, not go into one of the kind of immediate reactions of like, uh, it's not true or um, they should have built a different infrastructure or... There's nothing to do with me, or that's them. You know, it'll never like be anywhere but there. Right. Um, uh, I didn't like Pakistan anyway when I went through it. You know, <laughs> like whatever. Uh, you know, and to realize that it's not just them; that's us. And and that uh, I mean, this is one of the ways love is really defined, uh, which you also talk about somewhere about its interconnection. It's this acknowledgement that there's no nice dividing line. You know, that says, well, it's going to happen over there. Right. Well, I continue to have, you know, three cars or whatever it is over here. Right. Yeah, and I think it's that that ability to to connect um, with empathy for for folks that um, that are not right in front of us. That that is so key to acting ethically in in our complicated world. Um, you know, and and for us. For us now, I think the big the big growth period for for us as a species um, is being able not just to connect with the way we impact people on the other side of the world, but to see the way we connect we impact people who are not even born yet, mm-hmm. and um, to be able to to have a relationship with future generations and and connect empathically with them, so that we are sort of broadening our felt experience um, beyond just the, the realm of ourself and and beyond just our time and we're sort of looking back on ourselves through their eyes so how do you how do you get over like this kind of the centrality well it's like privilege really you know it's like feeling my experience is the experience and everything else is kind of happening on the margins and you know, it's like how how does one develop that empathy, in other words, so that it's it's truly inclusive. You know, like mm. through introspection, because you know yourself better, I think, and and then 
you kind of recognize yourself in others and through, I guess, awareness, sensitivity. Like, how does that education happen? Because, um, I don't know. I mean, I think it happens very different for for different people. Um, you know, and I think, um, I think from an early age, it develops as a as an ability to see how our actions impact others. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, you know, and I think there are, um, I think there are very positive pathways mm-hmm, that, mm-hmm. that people can develop that of, of seeing, Oh, when I, when I do this nice thing for this other person, you know, they react in this way. Um, and then when they react that way, it makes me feel better. Yeah. Um, yeah. you know, there are, there are, I know that there are people who, um, have developed it in that way. Um, you know, un- unfortunately my path was, um, was not that. And, um, and, and I'd say I, I developed that understanding through negative actions, um, and, and seeing how, um, my actions when I was younger hurt other people, um, and then seeing their pain and experiencing their pain, um, through empathy, um, and, and saying, oh, this is, this is awful. Yeah, um, yeah. I really have the ability to hurt people, um, and um, and and that to me was um, a really critical realization um, that that I am a danger to others, and and I think um, I think it's critical to being a, an ethical person is mm-hmm. is recognizing that. Um, we have the ability to hurt others. We are a danger. Mm-hmm. I, I I don't see this negative actually. I mean, it just seems like it's so true and and kind of beautiful, you know. Like because I think the root of that is being able to recognize your own pain. It's like the reason we kind of you know have that that sense of empathy with somebody we just lied to, for example, and is because we, we can be in touch with the devastation of being lied to ourselves, you know, and mm-hmm. we, we kind of almost recollect it, I think, in our bodies, and and then we think, oh, I don't want to go there, <laughs> you know, like I don't want to visit that upon someone else. That really hurt. But if you're really cut off, you don't feel that. And so the ways we act toward others, it has no grounding in our own self-awareness in a way. Yeah, and I think, and I think it's really easy to get caught in the trap of shame yeah. where um, once we start thinking of ourselves as a fundamentally bad person, um, then then we think we deserve to be disconnected. We think we're unlovable. And um, and so we make that happen. And, you know, and we, we hurt those people around us. Um, and I think, I think we're still feeling with empathy that person's pain, you know, that it causes us pain when we hurt other people. But once we're in that cycle of shame, um, you know, we think we deserved that pain yeah. that we get back through empathy. Yeah. Um, and, and it's, it's very, very difficult, I think, to, um, to take the initiative to break oneself out of the, the cycle of, of shame. Um, because, because it tells us, um, about our own identity, that that we are incapable of anything else, yeah. that we are defined by by those wrong actions, yeah. Yeah. Um, and so I think it almost always has to be sort of a uh, an act of grace that that breaks through that from from the outside, whether that's um, from another caring person or whether that's from God mm-hmm. that that breaks in and um, and shows us that we are loved despite what we're doing at the yeah. moment. Yeah. I mean, that, you know, of course, is so uh, central to my kind of main work, you know, around loving kindness and, mm-hmm. and that um, I think it is the opening to just that, that uh, some people, you know, will call it basic goodness, but um, it, it's sort of like an essential all rightness, you know, <laughs> like integrity, mm-hmm. uh, which we mar and we blow and we, you know, make mistakes and we do all kinds of things with and. Um, this is very beautiful saying from the Buddha, which is something like, um, if you truly loved yourself, you'd never harm another. Mm-hmm. And sometimes in that recollection of the harm we have created, uh, we do feel that lack of love, but we don't, 
if we get stuck there, then we're just stuck. You know, that's it. And we are capable of so much more. Mm -hmm. People sometimes say, how do you have compassion for, often say, how do you have compassion for this person who you think is dreadful, you know, is doing these terrible things? And and I think it's, it's, uh, it's a complex question. It's a complex answer, which I'll, I'll ask you that question. But, um, you know, for me, it's partly... Uh, understanding compassion isn't weakness, you know? It's not right. saying, like, oh, you poor thing, keep going, you know? Like, uh, it, it can be the source of great strength. And partly it's feeling we are capable of so much more, each of us, and that to see somebody dedicate their lives to kind of hurting others or being so alone and, and so um, kind of invulnerable, you know, untouched, and or to... Uh, what you said earlier was really fascinating that to lack that link between our actions and their consequences, which is a very big lack, you know, mm -hmm. um, you know, to live in that way as though what we did didn't matter. And uh, those are really problematic states and, and they're kind of worthy of a sort of compassion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, and in terms of having compassion for, um, those who are doing something genuinely wrong, yeah, those that yeah. um, that we really object to, um, you know, I think part of part of what's complicated there is that the the act of having compassion and really loving someone who's in that position of of shame um, actually, I think, frees them up to then have guilt for for what they're doing wrong. You know, that there's in that in that division between guilt and shame, guilt is focused on on an action, on what we did wrong, mm -hmm. whereas shame is focused on our ourselves, our identity, um, and tells us that we're a wrong wrong person. Um, but I think in order to to have guilt for our actions, um, we need to sort of turn and look at that action and say that action uh, over there was wrong. But when we when shame internalizes that action and says, well, that's just who I am, we're not able to ever mm -hmm. confront that action mm -hmm. um, and have any sort of accountability for, uh, for what went wrong. Um, and so I, I actually think even for someone who you know, is, is doing really unjust things, um, that, act of, that act of compassion for that person um, is still necessary um, but of course it's, it's very, um, difficult when you're the one who, who has been harmed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and I think that's where a community of compassion is really critical. Um, uh, and, and trusting that, um, you know, in the, in the cases where we have been traumatized by, by someone that, um, that we might not we might not need to beat ourselves up for not having compassion, not being the one who liberates that person from mm -hmm. their shame, mm -hmm. um, and trusting that that there can be others out there um, who can step in. Um, and I think that's the wonderful thing about grace, as opposed to forgiveness, is that um, grace doesn't have to be done by the person who was wronged, uh, or I think forgiveness does. And um, and so I think part of um, part of being in solidarity with people who um, have been hurt and have been traumatized, for me, um, you know, is not standing with them with hatred for that person who did this wrong thing. Um, but I think in a lot of cases, it can be actually offering grace and compassion uh, to the person who did something wrong to, to liberate that person who was traumatized um, to, to just deal with themselves mm -hmm. and... Um, mm -hmm. and and not have to have any responsibility for um, for that person who did something to them. Yeah, that's really beautifully said. The way I've more awkwardly said it, some, or thought it, actually, I don't know if I've ever said it, uh, when people have said, you know, I don't think I can forgive this being who hurt my family so terribly, or, you know, and, and, and I think, uh, I don't know that that's your job, actually, you know. Like you have a job of grieving or, you know, like your work is, that, right. that's that's a bridge too far, you know, like 
because then it's just imaginary. It's just a story. Right. Like, oh, I must do this, you know, and uh, not that it's not possible, but, you know, um, I really do believe it is possible, but uh, not as a kind of fanciful, idealistic pressure, <laughs> you know? Right. Like, yeah. But yeah. That's, that's a beautiful sort of, um, expansion of it, you know, like it's someone else's job, you know, <laughs> like <laughs> right, and you know, I mean, I think for um, for people of a certain Christian theology, um, they've they've had that um, sort of psychological ease um, with allowing themselves to say, well, God will for mm-hmm. you know, it's up to God to to forgive or to offer grace for for that person. Um, and you know, and I think that that is true. But you know that that same Christian Bible tells us to be imitators of God. Yeah. And and I strongly believe that that we have that spark of divinity within each of us, that um, that gives us the ability to offer that grace to one another as well. And um, and there's certainly a lot of need for it in the world. And and so I think that ability gives us the responsibility to offer it as well. So is that how we love our enemies? Through that, I think so. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think it's a um, an impossible standard, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. particularly when you're the one who who has been hurt. Yeah, yeah. Um, and and it can be um, a huge effort um, just to restrain yourself from vengeance. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, even if you're still harboring. Um, a lot of resentment or hatred mm-hmm. in your heart mm-hmm. for that person, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. just to restrain your hand from vengeance, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, can can be critical. And and then just trusting that um, that others can be offering grace while you're just healing yourself. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think. Yeah, I mean, I think that is that is the essential gap, and it's something maybe we don't give ourselves enough credit for either. Um, in that, uh, as I'm often saying to people, you know, the gap between what you're feeling and how you're acting is really the most important Mm -hmm. cultivation, you know, at least in the beginning, because you may have that resentment in your heart, but uh, to be devoting yourself, your days to vengeance, you know, to vengeful acts is another whole thing, Mm -hmm. you know, and uh, that's a huge step to really have that kind of commitment to creating kind of good in this world and, uh, and also honoring our feelings, you know, not pretending mm-hmm. we don't feel what we feel, but but not but saying, you know, I know where that path leads. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna let that determine my choices and my mm-hmm. my actions because it will limit me. You know, it'll diminish me and and harm not only that person but me as well. And so, it's almost out of compassion for yourself, you say, well, I'm not going there. You know, right? Yeah, and you know, and I think that's that's one of those situations where that. Um, that gap between our feelings and our action um, can be acknowledged and and recognized, um, and we say, "I see that gap, and for now, I'm just going to fake it. <laughs> I'm I'm just going to uh, act like I need to act here." And um, and for me, that's that's how it is with a lot of um, courageous action as well. That um, you know, I think courage is one of their, those areas where um, faking it is is good enough. Like even if you don't feel mm-hmm. courageous at the moment, you can look at a situation and say, "Well, this is what I would do if I was courageous," and so I'll just act like it. Mm-hmm. Right now. I'll fake it. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Good job. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's that is really a good job. So, if you were um, going to use another word besides love, which is so. Uh, squishy <laughs> word sometimes. What would you say? I say connection, you know, just to give you a hint. Uh, you know, just kind of a sense of true connection. Yeah. Um, I mean, for me, for me, love is a, a very all-encompassing term, and so there are um, there are aspects of it that uh, that I use other terms for in. in various ways and sometimes that's connection um a a lot of times it's um it's gratitude and um and in my mind related to that is is sort of like um 
honesty or integrity that um that I think a lot of times um acting out of love means um having integrity and honoring our gratitude like recognizing the 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 gifts that we have received um and the gratitude that we have for for our lives and and those around us um and the only way to to honestly express that gratitude um is through caring action of of taking care of um the world and the others around us that that we are so grateful for that's fantastic and i think um in a way that that ties it all together because uh i often quote um well, I often tell the story about this time I went to uh, Walter Reed Army Hospital. It was Nurses Week. It was National or International Nurses Week. And so there were all these kind of offerings and classes and things like that. So obviously it was teaching meditation. So, uh, But I had a friend who was a nurse there. So before I did the, the talk, I, um, she gave me a, um, a tour or, you know, a short tour of one of the wards and and it was, you know, as you might imagine or know, you know, it's extremely intense. It was mm -hmm. like between the uh, soldiers who'd been wounded and their families, you know, and it was like, it was really, really intense. And uh, we finished the tour and then my friend who was a nurse there said, she turned around and said to me, um, the nurses who can stay here, so that of course means the ones who can continue to serve, right? The nurses who can stay here are not the ones who get lost in sorrow. The nurses who can stay here are the ones who can connect to the resilience of the human spirit. Yeah. Um, and that kind of redefined compassion for me. You know, in mm -hmm. that moment, I thought, oh, right. And I thought about, um, you know, the uh, music in the civil rights era or, you know, around your your trial, you know. Yeah. Like, um, you know, I'm just reading about thousands of people singing in the streets and outside the courthouse. Uh, especially in the most stressful moments. So here's a quote from you. Um, Singing together literally brings us into harmony and reminds us that we are part of something much bigger than ourselves. Hmm. Yeah. You know, and um, and actually one of the people who um, wrote one of the songs that, that we sang a lot outside of the trial that became central to that, um, Brian Cahall is a singer-songwriter, and I've... Um, and I stayed connected with him through that time and, and sort of drew him more and more into my circle. And, um, he's now living in my house. And <laughs> <laughs> it's really in your circle. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and we're, we're working together pretty closely with, um, a lot of the work that I do whenever I guest preach or that sort of thing. He does the music for the services. Um, and, and he's got a lot of, he's got a lot of songs that really look at the, um, the hardest parts of, of life in our world and, and of his own experience and kind of writes out of his own sorrow and grief. Um, and, uh, I remember I was listening to him, uh, in the car a few years ago and giving a friend a ride. And she said, um, Oh, your music is so depressing. Can we put on something else? <laughs> um, and it actually surprised me when she said that. And I realized I'd never thought of it as, um, as depressing music because, for me, there's something about there's something that that art in general can do, but particularly for me, music, of of when it looks at the darkest and ugliest parts of of our world and of human experience, and and makes something beautiful out of it. Mm -hmm. That that to me is um, just fundamentally hopeful, um, and and a, a far stronger source of hope for me than trying to avoid those those dark and um and ugly parts of of human experience and pretending like they don't exist um you know which to me suggests that we're not strong enough to handle them but when we when we look directly at them and and turn them into beauty that to me is the the real grounds for hope that's amazing that's wonderful it reminds me of when uh your friend's comment, the first time I ever went to Ireland, I was sitting in a car, you know, and someone was driving, and 
He said, would you like to hear some traditional Irish music? So he said, sure. So he turned on whatever. And, and there was this song, which was basically, you know, oh, my love, they're taking you away tomorrow on the prison ship and we'll no doubt starve to death while you're gone, <laughs> you know? And I was like, oh, my God, that's like very, very sad, uh, you know? But there was that strain in the culture and let's make music about it. Right. You know? Yeah. And, and you know, and I think we used to have that here. You know, my my partner, her, her family lives out in Western Connecticut and, and is and has had a farm there for many generations and, and is still connected to the land there. And, um, and her great aunts and great par- grandparents there, um, they still sing some of these songs that, that they sang in their families when they grew up. Um, you know, and some of them are like these songs about dead babies and like joking about it. And, um, I mean, really, really harsh stuff, but it, but it kind of harkens back to, um, that that time of life when you know when a good number of newborns did die mm-hmm, and that sort mm-hmm. of thing um when life was much harder and um and they had to find a way to make meaning out of it yeah. and and part of that was um was turning that that heartache into beauty and into joy through those songs yeah that's fabulous well thank you so much yeah my pleasure thanks for having me wow this is great I want to move in. Can I move in too? <laughs> well, thanks so much for taking the time to be here today. Uh, for everybody who's listening, you can learn more about Tim's work by visiting his website at timdechristopher.org. It's T-I-M-D-E-C-H-R-I-S-T-O-P-H-E-R.org. Thank you for listening. Real Love is now available for pre-order and hits stores on June 6th, 2017. To order your copy and receive an exclusive meditation from the book, please visit SharonSalzberg.com. This podcast has been brought to you by the Be Here Now Network. May all beings be happy.